morning, everyone. We welcome you all to Fardale Trinity Church. So happy you've joined us this beautiful Sunday morning to worship the Lord and fellowship together. As you make your way to your pews, we ask that you would rise with us as I read this morning's call to worship reading from Psalm 147, verse 1. It says, Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise him. Let's pray. Lord, we echo these words from the psalmist that it is just fitting to praise you. We love to gather together as your people to sing your praises and to bring honor and glory to your name. We just pray that this morning all that we do and all that we say, our hearts, our minds, our actions, and our words would be honoring and glorifying in your sight. We thank you, Father, for who you are and how you continue to work in our lives. We just pray that our lives would be a reflection of what you've done for us. We commit ourselves and we commit this service completely to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord with our voices. There is now a hope that lasts beyond our days. For the one that once was buried lives again. Now the tomb is bare and empty and the stone is rolled away. Praise the risen one who overcame.
salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Fardell family. It's good to welcome you here on this uh, beautiful Sunday morning in June. And uh, I want to congratulate you all. You all made it for our first early service time. Summer schedule is uh, here. And uh, go ahead and pat yourself on the back. You made it at 945, and it's just so great to see you. And a special time as we worship the Lord together. We have the opportunity and privilege to meet around the Lord's table. The Lord's table is for the specific purpose of remembering Him. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God who died and paid the once-for-all sacrifice for our sins. No more sacrifices needed. Jesus paid it all, all to him we owe. We think back about his sacrifice. We meditate on our own lives to see if we are representing him well in the new life that he has given to us, and we look forward to to the time when, according to Scripture, we will one day meet all around his table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. What a glorious day that will be. You know, as I was preparing for the Lord's table this morning, the Lord directed my thoughts to a hymn. And it's uh, often been said that the Christian hymnal next to the Bible itself is probably one of the best doctrine and theology books that we have because there's so many rich experiences that people just like you and I have written about knowing the Lord and how grateful they are. One such hymn says this, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, has been nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. It goes on to say, and Lord, Haste the day when my faith will be sight, the clouds will be rolled back as a scroll, the trump will resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. Is it well with your soul this morning? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you know him? Do you love him? And do you celebrate the fact that he died in your place to pay for your sins? And you're looking forward to his coming again. So when we meet around the table and we partake of these elements, the bread uh, representing his body that was sacrificed for us, his blood that was shed for us to pay the price for our sins, let's think about that sacrifice and ways in which we can live out Christ in us until he comes again. In just a moment, uh, our men are going to be distributing the elements. Uh, Please Do not partake until we can partake all together. But during this time, as some music is played, um, uh, we just ask you to meditate and talk to the Lord and make sure that you have a right relationship with Jesus Christ, thanking him for the salvation Mm -hmm. he's given to us. Men, if you'll come, we'll pray, and then we'll partake together. Father God, 
thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, the Holy One, the only one who was qualified to pay the price for our sins. We do not bear uh, our sins or the penalty of them anymore because of what you did, and we are grateful, Lord, for that. So as we, we meet around this table, may our hearts reach out to you, thanking you and praising you until you come again, promising you that we will live for the one who died for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Apostle Paul, in this room, so find someone you don't know and introduce yourself. Shake their hand and welcome them today. Let's take some time to fellowship together. Would you do that?
Why don't we all return to our pews? Let's all rise and we'll sing the family of God together because that's exactly who we are. Hey, good morning again, everybody. We welcome you to Fardell Trinity Church. So glad you're here to worship and fellowship to praise the Lord together. Before Brian comes up to do our regular morning announcements, I just wanted to thank all of you for your participation in our annual Haiti Benefit Garage Sale and Car Wash yesterday and Friday. Uh, what a great event all around. Uh, so many of you were praying for this, and we thank you for your prayers. So many of you donated some of your items to this, and we thank you for that. And so many of you uh, gave up your time and your effort, your skill to serve this and to lead this, and we thank you for that as well. I uh, just wanted to give you an update. On Friday, the uh, garage sale itself uh, did right around 3900 On Saturday, the garage sale itself did right around 2500 and the car wash yesterday did four, right around 450. So we had a total of $6,886 and more is continuing to come in. I would say that's well over 7,000, close to $8,000 right now. So praise the Lord. <coughs> yeah, as you remember all of that, uh, all of the proceeds, all of the funds that were raised goes toward uh, supporting Faval through his college education. He's finishing up his sophomore year. He'll be a junior in September, and all of this goes a long way. So thank you all very much, and praise the Lord. All right, thanks, Mike. Great news on that. And again, good morning and welcome to Fardell Trinity Church. We're glad you've chosen to come and worship with us here on this beautiful Sunday morning in June. And again, congratulations for making it at 9.45 at our summer schedule. You know what that means? When Sunday school rolls around in September, you'll have no problem making it to Sunday school at 9.30. So looking forward to a very large crowd in Sunday school in a couple of months. But in the meantime, uh, announcements of things that are going on here at the church uh, as the summer rolls on. Uh, we continue to have many uh, great things happening. If you want to keep up with those things, we encourage you to check out our website. Uh, it's, it's available 24-7. Uh, we're also on Facebook and Instagram. We encourage you to follow us there and share out uh, news and announcements. You also get some motivating uh, stuff throughout the week. Uh, also, if you have any questions, you have any problems, you have a request, you have a need, uh, feel free to reach out. Pastor Lee and Pastor Mike both share their emails in the bulletin. The church office phone number is there as well. Uh, and they're here throughout the week. So throughout the summer, throughout the week, uh, Lee and or Mike will be here throughout the week. Uh, if you'd like to stop by and say hi, feel free to do so. Uh, happy to see you, happy to help you wherever we can, and glad you've chosen again to worship with us and look forward to having you plug in with our many ministries throughout the year. One of our partnerships that we have is the Baby Bottle Boomerang. Hopefully you've picked up a baby bottle. They've been available since Mother's Day. Uh, we return them by Father's Day, so you fill it with, uh, with your spare change. There's also information about Life Advocates Ministries in there and how you can support them in other ways. Uh, but we do ask that you bring those back. Father's Day is now uh, two more Sundays from now. Uh, so we encourage you uh, to keep filling them with the change. And uh, as we partner with Life Advocates Ministries, they're a local uh, ministry here in Bergen and Passaic counties that help uh, troubled teens and pregnant teens and pregnant uh, families uh, with uh, support uh, towards bringing those pregnancies to birth and then the options thereafter, adoption or raising their child, giving them supplies and counseling. It's a, it's a great ministry here uh, for us <coughs> to help partner with uh, in this way. So. Please bring your baby bottles back filled with change uh, by Father's Day. Also, 
Yeah, it's summertime. So guess what? VBS is right around the corner. It's only uh, two months away. Uh, this year, we have a, it's like a leap year. It actually starts the last day in July. Usually we're that first week in August. Well, this is that first full week in August. Actually starts in July. So it's July 31st uh, through uh, August 4th. It's the greatest show on earth. And we need help. We need you to help and, and uh, volunteer. You'll see there's things from Building Crew, which is the, the weeks before. Uh, so you can help build. Uh, you can help with sports and games. You can help serve and perhaps even, I'd say, maybe sample snacks if you're into that kind of thing. So there's, there's availability to help with snacks. You can do with crafts. I'm not even going to say these words because I don't think I can a, a craft torsionist. You can help with crafts. You can help ki get kids registered. That's beforehand and, and the mornings of. Uh, you can help with the picnic on Friday night, and also we have a cleanup crew uh, on Saturday. So go out to our website. You'll see that there's a registration. Even if you're a church regular, we ask you to register. Also, the sign-up sheets to help out are in the back. You'll see more emails about that as well. So we have availability to help before, during, at the conclusion of, and after. So we look forward to having you uh, volunteer. This is always a great big event for our church, a great outreach for our community, and an opportunity for everyone here to serve. So we encourage you to do that. Uh, please uh, sign up ASAP uh, so we know where we need help. I know the teachers' meetings has already happened, so we have our teaching teams in place, and we just need to fill in all those extra places, including uh, setup, cleanup, and the Friday night picnic, which is always a great time. Last year, I burnt off an eyebrow at the barbecue, and I'm, I, it finally grew back. So I'm pretty excited about that. I'm looking forward to having my crew back on the barbecue next year as well uh, in a couple of weeks. So, uh, you know, callous up those hands, boys, and get ready to flip some burgers. It'll be a great time. We're very much looking forward to that. Hopefully we won't beat 800 degrees uh, right outside and then on top of the grill on top of that again this year. But pray for it as well. Great opportunity uh, for us to have an outreach in the community. So pray that the word would go forth and that we have a great week at VBS. At this time, I'm going to ask Ed to come up. He's going to read and pray with us. Good morning, and uh, thanks, Brian. Before I do the reading, I, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, on behalf of the board, Brian, myself, I want to take a minute just to say thank you. A big thank you to all those who gave of their time and talents last week and over the weekend at the garage sale. Um, the money will go a long way to further the education of, ha of our young fella in Haiti. But more importantly, I, I got to be here for a bunch of days during the week just watching, and then... Friday and Saturday, and if you had the time to stop in, what you really saw was God in action. It was amazing. People just loving one another, loving this church, and loving the Lord, and it was, sh it was coming out in how people were welcoming those coming into our church. A true blessing. Uh, for those who couldn't be here, I encourage you next year, mark your calendar to be here. It's just an amazing ministry, uh, and I have to say, by example, how people lead. Uh, Renee and the team inside is just, you just watch them serve, and that's what they're doing, serving. Mike with their youth group, uh, they washed cars from nine o'clock till three o'clock, and it was amazing to see our youth group, young adults, adults, all working together. So praise God for the hearts of service that come from this church. Praise God for their willingness to give of their time and talents to serve. I am most grateful that I had the opportunity to watch it in action. So thank you to all those who serve. God bless you. Let's go uh, to our reading, Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble, gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this beautiful spring morning. It's a reminder of all your blessings, creations, and provisions. Heavenly Father, as Pastor Lee continues this sermon series on Ephesians, we pray that you open our mind and our heart to your word. May this sermon message grow us closer to you 
and continue to transform our actions into doers of your word. We praise you, Lord, that you, that you poured out your amazing grace on us as part of your purpose in bringing a sense of unity in this divided world, a world that has dismissed you as Lord and Savior. Let our hearts be flooded with light. Give us insight, wisdom, and knowledge so that we can understand the confident hope that you have given all those you called. I pray that we live lives worthy of your calling. Lord, constantly remind us that you who called us walks with us. You who called us will empower us. You who called us will protect us. May the Holy Spirit who lives in our heart make us gentle, humble, patient, and compassionate so that we may become more and more like your son. Inspire us, Lord, to live each day in faith, loving you and loving one another. And let us be reminded that you are the God of heaven, the great and awesome God. Through your love, mercy, and grace, we can live alive together in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your guidance and care in all our days, for you restore our soul, give us peace, and bring us hope. We lift these prayers to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ed. We're going to dismiss our children at this time, ages four through grades four. You can go downstairs, kids, for All Kids Church. Enjoy a good time of singing and worship and learning from the Word together downstairs. As the kids are leaving to go down there, I invite you who are staying here in the auditorium in the sanctuary to join me in Ephesians chapter four this morning. Ephesians chapter four. If you're just joining us for the first time today, we're in the middle of a study of this letter, uh, the letter to the church at Ephesus written by the Apostle Paul. And uh, one of the main themes that we've uncovered in this book, in this letter, is about the church and really about the head of the church, Jesus Christ. And so we've been looking at these passages that teaches us, uh, teach us about the praise of His glory in the church and how God designed the church before the foundations of the world, each individual member who would come to faith in Christ, become part of the body of the church, and then how the church works together. Today we're going to look at a very, 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 very important topic related to church life. And that is the topic of spiritual gifts. And the fact that those spiritual gifts really are God's blueprint to build the church through unity in using those spiritual gifts. You know what a blueprint is. If you've ever built a home or even a shed, usually they give you a diagram of what it's going to look like, the dimensions and all of the ingredients or all of the tools you'll need, the, the screws, the, the nails, everything, braces that will go into building that facility. Well, this chapter, chapter 4, is God's blueprint where he will show us exactly uh, what he wants to be accomplished through you and through me together, building unity in recognizing and utilizing our spiritual gifts. Now, one commentator mention this about chapter 4 because it really is a turning point in the book of Ephesians in many ways. This commentator said that after three chapters of solid instruction in the foundational truths of God, Paul takes a dramatic turn and shifts his emphasis from doctrine to duty, from principles to practice. Good stuff, right? So, you know, when you use glue in a wood project, here's the deal. You want it to last. You want it to stick. You want to bond something together, right? And if you go and look at that table, you can see that Jake and his team did a pretty good job. That thing is solid. You can't even see the seam where the parts are. It's pretty amazing. Well, that's the kind of glue that we're going to be talking about today in the use of our spiritual gifts to bond us tightly together. Um, Ed's introduction and 
um, word of thanks to you as a body of believers could not be a better fit as an illustration for what this passage teaches because I too want to say thank you for your involvement in a great project over this weekend. I saw people working together. I saw people giving of their time and some treasures and, and just pulling together and encouraging each other because we had a common goal together. Praise the Lord. That's the body working together. So in essence, there's one example that you've already been doing this week of textually what we're going to unfold today to see how spiritual giftedness really is used in the church. And friends, I, I need to just say this straight out. This never goes away. This is what the body does. The purpose of God saving you and putting you into this body, this place called Fardell Trinity Church, is so that God can use you to glorify Him through building a, uh, other people up in their faith through the use of spiritual gifts. And you're going to find out that you have at least one today. You and I need something that is long-lasting and has a stick to -itiveness. That's probably not a word, but it's a word that just kind of is invented to describe what glue does. It sticks us together. So I want to jump in and talk about this process of understanding the blueprint of God's building unity into his body through the giving and use of spiritual gifts. Here's the first concept I want to talk about. There are two partners in the church that make the spiritual glue work. Who are they? Let's look at them in verses 1 through 3. Paul says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, I'm exhorting you to live in a manner worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, putting up with one another in love, being eager to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So here's Paul being the spiritual cheerleader for the church. Now remember, he's a prisoner. He's writing this letter from prison. And he is exhorting, he's pleading, he's encouraging the church at Ephesus on this topic of unity in the church and how they will use spiritual gifts to accomplish that unity. Now, here are the two partners that make the glue work. I hope you noticed the word you in that passage. He says, I exhort you to live in a manner worthy of the calling with which you were called. Make no mistake about it. God, through Jesus Christ, his son, as the head of the church, is calling you as an individual part of this church to get off the sidelines and get involved. To do that which is necessary and profitable, not only in your own life, but in the lives of others, to encourage them to keep walking the walk, talking the talk, doing the work of the ministry together. For those of you that served this last week in the garage cell, is, is there joy in serving Jesus together? I, I would say there is. Uh, because we, we kind of rub off each other. You know, it's, it, we get a little tired, we might get a little sweaty, and oh, you know, things are, we've got a problem to solve here. But when we come together, we understand for a common purpose, we're going to be there. And God wants to reach out to each one of you to be part of that body. But did you notice the type of characteristics that God wants from you and you and you and me? What type of you does God want to use in the body? And he describes some characteristics very specifically. Your attitude and how you are perceived and your calling will make all the difference as to how God will use you in the body. And here's some of the characteristics he lists in verse 2. He talks about you and I coming with humility and gentleness. 
we all can't be chiefs. We all can't be the leader. Um, there may be times where we might need to submit to someone else in humility and meekness because they've got a little bit more experience or know-how. We should be willing to do that. Um, I, I often tell guys when I'm working in a ministry team and, and, and I'm the leader, I, I often tell them, look, I'm not the only one with good ideas in the room. I'm not the only one with talents and abilities. You also are part of it. So if we are all in this together, exercising humility and gentleness, we don't really care who gets the, the, the glory for what gets accomplished as, as long as God is the one who is served in his purposes. So the concepts of humility and gentleness, patience, he uses a phrase here, putting up with one another. That's the, the term that Paul uses in other places, the term forbearance. And forbearance literally means to not make an issue of people's little faults because we all have them. And so we're going to literally put up with each other, not with the attitude, well, I have to, you know, that's the way they are. No, we say, you know, in humility, we all have our strengths and weaknesses, and so God is going to involve the you of each individual to build each other up. I like the way William McDonald puts this in his commentary on Ephesians. He says that meekness or lowliness and humility is the attitude that submits to God's dealings without rebellion and to man's unkindness without retaliation. Friends, that's humility, that's lowliness, that's putting God first, others second, ourselves last. But did you notice the second partner here in making the glue work in the church? You, but also it is the Holy Spirit within you. That last phrase, being eager to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So if you want to be part of a body and serving God together, and you want to encourage other believers and allow them to encourage you. Notice something here. It's the Holy Spirit inside all of us. And we talked about this in detail last week, how that the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation indwells us permanently. He takes residence in us. So it's not like we have to invent something new in order for God to use us in the church. In fact, look at the specific way in which Paul describes this. He says, keep the unity of the Spirit. Don't invent it. Take what the Spirit has already done in your life and in the body and keep that moving forward. One author describes it this way, that Paul did not instruct believers to procure unity in the church. He simply asks us to maintain the unity that already exists from the Holy Spirit. So, make no mistake about it, if you want to be part of a local body of believers like Fardale, and you want to get involved in affecting other people uh, in a positive way, engaging with them, encouraging them to walk in faith and to not give up, the two participants in any local church is you and the Holy Spirit. You exhibiting fruits of the Holy Spirit, like humility, gentleness, forbearance, and the Holy Spirit within us, who's already created the bond of peace. Remember, Paul has already demonstrated that in the church, he created a peace between two opposite, polar opposite kinds of people, Jews and Gentiles. He brought them together, and Jesus Christ became their peace. So I think what Paul is saying here is, look, if if the Holy Spirit has already done that and he's brought those two diverse groups together, can't we learn how to not just get along but actually encourage each other as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and exhibit the fruits of the Holy Spirit in our lives? That's what we need to be committed to. The church doesn't need prima donnas. The church doesn't need people that say, hey, I'm your man, nobody else counts. The church needs people who humbly and meekly and with forbearance say, you know what, <laughs> these brothers and sisters here I love. 
and I want to be part of God's blueprint in them building my life and me building their life. Is that the kind of relationship you desire with the people that are here in this room that gather every Sunday or that serve in different ministries? You and the Holy Spirit together forming the bond, that great bond, that glue that works and sticks together. Now secondly, I want you to notice all of the uh, unifying factors or unifying ingredients that the Holy Spirit uses in our lives once we are committed to join the team. This is an interesting passage. Read, uh, uh, Ed read it earlier. But I, I want you to notice specifically the word one in these three verses, how many times it's used. He says, if the body's to be unified, I want you to understand the things that unify us, the things that are non-negotiable, the things that really gave us entrance into the body and into each other's lives, performed again by the work of God in bringing us to himself and placing us in this body of believers. So count them with me. Paul says that we are part of one body. And we are part of one body by one spirit, just as you were called, with one hope of your calling. Uh, one Lord, one faith, I'm running out of fingers, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. How many ones, how many fingers do I have up? Can you see? Seven of them. There's seven ones. One, 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 one. Do you think that Paul is really instructing the church about unity? This is what we agree on. This is our oneness. The oneness or unity of the church was created by these seven principles. Now, let's just make a quick comment on each one of them so we understand. One body, what's that talking about? Okay, that's talking about the church, which is the body of Christ. Christ is the head, we are the body, and each individual member is part of that body. We're going to look at verses a little bit later in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 through 14 that illustrate individual members of the body, but yet uh, all together in one body, one spirit. Do you know there's only one way that you could get entrance, admission to the body of Christ, and that's through the Holy Spirit of God, who placed you. That's called the ministry, and I'm getting ahead of myself, of baptism in the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that in a second. But we all are part of the body of Christ if we've trusted Jesus as Savior, and that happened by a work of the Holy Spirit in our life, what did he give us immediately? He gave us one hope. What does that mean? Do you realize that something that you have in, in um, similarity or in sharing with everybody else in the body that truly knows Jesus as Savior is that you and I all share the same hope of our calling. What is it? It's eternal life, right? Our hope. It's the reality of knowing that God has sealed the deal. And there's no question of our eternal destiny. There's no question of what is the purpose of our life. Our purpose is to glorify God leading towards that blessed hope, Paul says to Titus. The blessed hope that one day when we're done serving, we'll enter into the presence of Jesus and we'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Are you looking forward to that? One hope. Then he says, um, one Lord. Well, the only way that you can get into the body through the place of the Holy Spirit is through a Savior named Jesus Christ, one Lord. Jesus himself said it, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father unless he comes through me. So we've got one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith. 
believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's no other way to please God. Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please God. Uh, one baptism, that's the one I was getting forward to, uh, fast forwarding to, the Holy Spirit, the word baptism means to place into, so at the moment of salvation, not only does the Holy Spirit come and permanently indwell us, but he baptizes us into his body, in other words, he takes each one of us and places us as members in the body of Christ, the universal church. If you are saved, you are a member of the universal church. Now, don't confuse that with local church membership. Although local church membership is really a picture of membership in the church. And we require the same thing, salvation in Jesus Christ, okay? And then to finish it off, he says, we have one God and Father overall. You've got to agree together who God is. That he is who he says he is. That we believe that what the scripture teaches about him, there's no variance, there's no self declaration of any other ideas that we think God might be. So all of these seven unifying factors, friends, these are how we came into the church. This is what unifies us. We can say, look, uh, yeah, I'm part of the body. Uh, I, the Holy Spirit placed me here. I have a hope in Christ. All of these things are identifying factors that keep us together. They are the very essential ingredients of the spiritual glue that God has created in the church. Now, the question is then, uh, how, um, how does that happen? Uh, how, how does, is it just a feeling that we, we feel good together and we, you know, we, we just... Uh, get along, can't we all get along together? It just ought to happen naturally, right? Well, not necessarily. Maybe you've heard this trite little poem that's often quoted, to dwell in heaven with saints above, oh my, that will be glory. But to live on earth with saints below, well, that's another story. It's not so easy to maintain the unity of the bond of the Spirit and thus we constantly remind ourselves of those factors of humility, grace, forbearance, and the oneness that has placed us into the body in the first place. Now, having identified those seven ingredients, let's get to the manifestation of how this takes place or the way, the instructions, and the properties of the spiritual glue that God is going to give to us. And we'll really spend most of our time left together in this. Instructions and properties of the spiritual glue. I want you to notice now he's specifically going to talk to us about spiritual gifts. Here's what Paul says beginning in verse 11. He says, now to each one of us, there's the word one that refers to you and you and you again. Every one of us was given this grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. And jumping down to verse 11, he begins to share some of the spiritual gifts that were given. It says, He himself gave some to be apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Why did he give those gifts? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. So we can see here that gifts were given by the Holy Spirit, and for three specific purposes they were given according to verse 12. Now, let's unpack this a little bit. Notice, first of all, grace was measured out by Christ. It says that right in the very first verse of this passage, verse 7, each one of us was given this grace. I, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but I will say it a couple of times. If you know Jesus as your Savior, you are guaranteed by the Holy Spirit to have at least one spiritual gift you may have more than one. We'll talk about that in more detail later. Secondly, this glue involves the spiritual gifts, and he lists them specifically in this passage of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, this is not a complete list of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. And by the way, I probably ought to stop here 
and say, what, what is a spiritual gift? It's not just a natural talent. Is singing a spiritual gift? The answer is no. It's a natural talent. I hate to tell you this, folks, but if you're tone deaf, there's nothing the Holy Spirit can do to help you become a good musician, okay? It's just not going to happen. We're not talking about natural abilities. We're not talking about a guy who can hit a baseball far or, or throw a spiral pass or can do really good woodworking projects. We're not talking about talents here. A spiritual gift is a specific enablement or empowerment by the Holy Spirit that will have a spiritual impact on someone else. Now, there will be some dovetailing sometimes of talents and spiritual gifts that we will see a little bit later. For instance, I use the, the talent of singing as an example. Maybe singing or musicianship is used as part of the spiritual gift of exhortation that we'll look at in a second. So, here's the deal. In the New Testament, there's three passages. This one, Ephesians 4, Romans 12, and 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, which give comparative lists of these gifts. Let me show you what I mean. By the way, all of this that you're about to see is not in your notes. I couldn't fit it in your notes. There's no way I could put all of this stuff in there. But here's the good news. I put together this chart, and it will be available for you on the back table for you to pick up. So you don't even have to worry about taking notes right now. You can just listen and look, and then say, oh yeah, Pastor Lee said there's going to be a chart in the back. I'll pick that up, and I'll look at that a little bit later. But notice these three columns, and the gifts that are listed there. Romans talks about prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, etc. 1 Corinthians, a variety of gifts, prophecy, wisdom, etc., and Ephesians, the gifts that we've just listed. Now, notice that there are a few gifts that are listed in red. And these gifts were meant specifically to be temporary gifts. I'll talk about them in a second. There's a couple gifts that are in blue that appear in multiple places of these lists, and then the ones in black are specific to those passages. So, Seeing what you can see there about those gifts, here's something, some principles that I want you to understand that Paul, in each of these passages, teaches. Number one, as I mentioned, all believers are given at least one spiritual gift. Some are given more, according to that list. But all the spiritual gifts are for the purpose of edifying the body. You don't get a spiritual gift so you can say, look at how great I am. Man, look at how God finally found the right person, and it's me, to be a great blessing to the church. That's not humility. That's not meekness. Notice this. Not everyone will have the same gifts. In fact, that passage in 1 Corinthians 12 asks the question, are all apostles? Are all prophets? No. The answer is no. Number four. I'm not sure why that's going off the, uh, the side there. Sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll read it for you. Some sign gifts were meant to be temporary in use in order to authenticate, in order to authenticate what the apostles were doing to, um, in their authority to advance the quick spread of the gospel to various people groups as the church began. Miracles, healing, tongues and interpretation of tongues. In fact, we're told in the scripture that those gifts were mentioned to be temporary gifts. For instance, here's some examples. There was no continuation of apostleship after the first century. Why? In order to be an apostle, you had to be a first-hand observer of the works and ministries and miracles of Jesus Christ. Well, that passed off the scene after that first generation died. There are no more apostles. If you find a church denomination that says we have apostles and prophets, ask them why they still are exercising spiritual gifts that were meant to be temporary in nature only. I'm not sure why I just lost that. Jake's, doing a, Jake's putting some extra glue in this one, I think, for me. Thanks, Jake. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, 
So some of the sign gifts were meant to be temporary in nature. Uh, no continuation of apostleship. Uh, number six, prophecies, tongues, and interpretation of tongues have also ceased. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You're going to have to do some extra study to look at this for your own. But really, those gifts were replaced by teaching, exhortation, the ministry of pastors, when the scriptures became complete. In other words, when the church was first being formed, these gifts were to authenticate ways in which the gospel could go out in many different languages and authenticate the authority of the apostles. But those gifts have passed away. Some of you might be fam familiar with the term a faith healer, but that gift has also ceased. Now that doesn't mean God isn't healing today. God certainly can heal people today. But the gift of a healer is not used anymore in the way it was in the early New Testament. Instead, and notice that this, it became normative by the end of the first century for the church to pray for the sick to be healed. That passage in James chapter 5 asks the question, are, are any of you sick? Well, let call, call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you. Notice James did not say, well, call someone that has the gift of of miraculous healing to come. No. Come and ask for prayer. And that became the normative response by the end of the first century to address that. And then lastly, I would mention that 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is much more corrective in nature than the passage in Romans 12 or Ephesians 4, which reveals that in Corinthians, in the Corinthian church, there was some misuse and misunderstanding of those gifts. Now, I know that's a lot to swallow. That's kind of a, a quick survey of how spiritual gifts are listed and compared in those three New Testament passages. But finish with me on some of these key things. If the glue of those spiritual gifts to build up is applied, three things will happen. And you notice it in verse 12. It will result in saints or believers being matured in their faith. They will then be equipped to do the work of the ministry together, and it will build up the body together. Three more things about this spiritual glue of spiritual gifts. The glue will bond us toward Christ. See if I can come up with that. Yeah. It says, until we reach the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. So in other words, spiritual gifts are always pointing us to con continue and increase our knowledge of Jesus Christ and who he is so that we can become mature in Christ. It also says the glue will keep the bond from breaking. Look at what he says in verse 14. He didn't want members to be... Uh, no longer children or infants in their faith, tossed about by waves and carried about by every wind of teaching, which happens a lot today, doesn't it? People just, they don't, they don't study the scriptures. Uh, they don't exercise their spiritual gifts. They don't get involved in it. And so they're carried away by various teachings that make no sense. And then lastly, he says, whoops, let me go back one. He says the glue will cause the body to grow. Verse 15, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow into him with reference to all things who is the head Christ. These gifts keep us not only bonded to Christ, but bonded to each other. So, as time slips away, how would we end our discussion on what we read from Ephesians chapter 4 on spiritual gifts. The effective result of the spiritual glue is what Paul lists in this verse. He says, from whom the whole body joined together and held together by every supporting ligament, according to the working by the measure of each single part, the growth of the body makes for the building up of itself in love. Here's what Paul's saying. We really are stuck together, whether we like it or not. This spiritual glue of utilizing our spiritual gifts forms a bond where we want to lock arms 
encourage each other, and keep moving forward for Jesus Christ. And did you notice it involves every effective work of every little dab of glue? I like that. It, it doesn't discount any of us. It says, according to the working by measure of each single part. Here's what that means. You are a dab of glue. Saying, thanks, Pastor. That, that's just what I needed this morning. I am a dab of glue. You are a dab of glue. You are a dab of glue. Okay. Have you ever used crazy glue or gorilla glue? And if you read the instructions carefully, it says, use sparingly. In other words, if you put like a big glob of super glue or a big glob of gorilla glue, what happens? It just pushes out the sides. It gets wasted. Instead... The example Paul is using here is every little part. You might not think that you're contributing much to the body of Christ, but oh yes you are. Every little dab of glue in every member, every participant counts, and every part of it increases body strength. The growth of the body makes for the building up of itself in love. It is a natural result of using our spiritual gifts that the body will be built up. So, here's what I want us to take with us today. And you can study this more as you pick up the charts on the back. I want to ask you this question. In order to build up Christ Church, are you, there's the first member or the first partner in this process, are you cooperating with the Holy Spirit to be that glue that makes the body stick together. In other words, are you committed to a stick to a long-haul approach that, hey, this is my church. I'm going to be a contributor. I'm going to be a helper. I'm going to get involved. But here's the thing I want to ask you as we close today. All of this information is good about spiritual gifts. But if all it is is information, we're missing the point. Because Paul wasn't just after giving out information to the church. He was actually after transformation. Preaching, teaching, utilizing of every spiritual gift is not just informative. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's nice. No, it ought to transform us. It ought to change the way we think about each other. It ought to change our attitudes and our motives and our actions towards each other. I am committed because God has made me a, what might seem to me an insignificant part of the body, but that's exactly what he wants. He wants faithful contribution from me in utilizing one or two or three spiritual gifts to build up others. Last question. Do you know what your spiritual gift is? or your spiritual gifts, go back to the list. It'll be on the back. Work your way through and say, God, which of these gifts or gifts have you given to me? So that I might begin to utilize them. And by the way, if you say, Pastor, I, I really don't know. I I've never really thought about what spiritual gift I have. Hey, we're here to help you discover that. And part of the way you discover what kind of spiritual gift you have is by actually asking others and getting involved in others' lives and trying out different things to say, you know what, if you really blessed me with using that gift in my life, then maybe that is the confirmation that that's exactly the kind of gift that God wants you to continue to use in building up others. Remember this picture? <laughs> There's an empty pew there, and an empty pew is not a church. A healthy church is where each member plays his or her part for the common good of the body. We need each other. We together are the glue that forms that stick to -itiveness. The church is not empty pews. It is a group of tight believers locking arm in arm, sticking together like glue, each one doing their part for the common good and the glory of God. We need each other to accomplish this over and over and over again until Jesus comes.
That's the blueprint for the church. That is what we are to be doing and how we are to be doing it, to be involved in each other's lives to the usefulness of the spiritual gifts that God has imparted to us to keep the unity of the church in the bond of peace. Let's pray together. Father, take this passage and the information it gives a lot and transform us. Transform our thinking and transform our hearts to love Christ more and to love his church more and to love individual members of this body more because we understand that we are part of the oneness that God has created. Lord, we love your church and we're grateful that you have made us part of it and ask that you would help us uh, to be um, profitable in building up the church and the unity of the church through the use of our spiritual gifts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we all rise and worship the Lord again with our voices together.